Book 9. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, O great Alcanus, preeminent among all people, surely indeed it is a good thing to listen to a singer such as this one before us, who is like the gods in his singing. For I think there is no occasion accomplished that is more pleasant than when festivity holds sway among all the populace, and the feasters up and down the houses are sitting in order and listening to the singer, and beside them the tables are loaded with bread and meats, and from the mixing bowl the wine steward draws the wine and carries it about and fills the cups. This seems to my own mind to be the best of occasions, but now your wish was inclined to ask me about my mournful suffering, so that I must mourn and grieve even more. What then shall I recite to you first of all? What leave till later? Many other sorrows the gods of the sky have given me. Now first I will tell you my name, so that all you may know me, and I hereafter, escaping the day without pity, be your friend and guest, though the home where I live is far away from you. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known before all men for the study of crafty designs, and my fame goes up to the heavens. I am at home in sunny Ithaca. There is a mountain there that stands tall, leaf trembling Neridos, and there are islands settled around it, lying one very close to another. There is Dialetian and same wooded Zacanthos, but my island lies low and away, last of all in the water toward the dark, with the rest below facing east and sunshine, a rugged place, but a good nurse of men. For my part, I cannot think of any place sweeter on earth to look at. For in truth, Calypso, shining among divinities, kept me with her in her hollow caverns, desiring me for her husband. But never could she persuade the heart within me, so it is that nothing is more sweet in the end than country and parents ever, even when far away one lives in a fertile place. But when it is an alien country, far from his parents... But come, I will tell you my voyage home with its many troubles, which Zeus inflicted on me as I came from Troyland. From Ilion, the wind took me and drove me ashore at Ismaros by the Caconians. I sacked their city and killed their people, and out of their city, taking their wives and many possessions, we shared them out so that none might go cheated of his proper portion. There I was for the light foot and escaping and urged it, but they were greatly foolish and would not listen. Then there was much wine was being drunk, and they slaughtered many sheep on the beach and lumbering horn curved cattle. But meanwhile, the Caconians went and summoned the other Caconians, who were the neighbors living in the inland country, more numerous and better men, well skilled in fighting, men with horses, but knowing too at need the battle on foot. They came at early morning, like flowers in season or leaves, and the luck that came our way from Zeus was evil, to make us unfortunate. So we must have had hard pains to suffer. Both sides stood and fought their battles there by the running ships, and with bronze-headed spears they cast at each other. And as long as it was early and the sacred daylight increasing, so long we stood fast and fought them off, though there were more of them. But when the sun had gone to the time for unyoking of cattle, then at last the Caconians turned the Acacians back and beat them, and out of each ship six of my strong, graved companions were killed, but the rest of us fled away from death and destruction. From there, we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death, but still grieving at heart for the loss of our dear companions. For even, even though I would not suffer the flight of my oar-swept vessels until a cry had made three times for each of my wretched companions who died there on the plain, killed by the Caconians, Cloud-gathering Zeus drove the north wind against our vessels in a supernatural storm, and huddled under the clouds, scuds, land alike, and the great water. Night sprang from heaven. The ships were swept along, yawning down the current. The violence of the wind ripped our sails into three or four pieces. These then, in fear of destruction, we took down and stowed in the ship's holes, and rowed them on ourselves until we made the mainland. There for two nights and two days, together we lay up, for pain and weariness, together eating our hearts out. But when the fair-haired dawn in her rounds brought on the third day, we, setting the masts upright and hoisting the white sails on them, sat still, and let the wind and the steersmen hold them steady. And now I would have come home unscathed to the land of my fathers, but as I turned the hook of Malia, the sea and current and the north wind beat me off course and drove me on past Kithria. Nine days then I was swept along by the force of the hostile winds on the fishy sea, but on the tenth day we landed in the country of the lotus eaters. 
who live on a flowering food. And there we set foot on the mainland and fetched water, and my companions soon took their support there by the fast ships. But after we had tasted a food and drink, then I sent some of my companions ahead, telling them to find out what men, eaters of bread, might live here in this country. I chose two men and sent a third with them as a herald. My men went on and presently met the lotus eaters. Nor did these lotus eaters have any thoughts of destroying our companions, but they only gave them lotus to taste of. But any of them who ate the honey-sweet fruit of lotus was unwilling to take any message back or to go away. But they wanted to stay there with the lotus-eating people, feeding on lotus and forgetting to free the way home. I myself took these men back, weeping by force to where the ships were, and put them aboard under the rowing benches and tied them fast and gave the order to the rest of my eager companions to embark on the ships in haste for fear someone else might taste the lotus and forget the way home. And the men quickly went aboard and sat to the oar locks, and sitting well in the order, dashed the oars in the gray sea. From there, grieving still at heart, we sailed on further along and reached the country of the lawless, outrageous cyclops, who, putting all their trust in the immortal gods, neither plow with their hands nor plant anything, but all grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation, wheat and barley, and also the grapevines, which yield for them wine of strength. And it is Zeus's rain that waters it for them. These people have no institutions, no meetings for councils. Rather, they make their habitation in caverns hollow, among the peaks of the high mountains, and each one is a law for his own wives and children, and cares nothing about the others. There is a wooded island that spreads away from the harbor, neither close in the land of the, of the Cyclops nor far out from it. Forested, wild goats beyond number breed there, for there is no coming and going of humankind to disturb them, nor are they visited by hunters who in the forest suffer hardships as they haunt the peaks of the mountains. Neither again is it held by herald flocks nor farmers, but all its days, never plowed up and never planted, it goes without people, and supports the bleeding wild goats. For the Cyclops have no ships with cheeks of vermilion, nor have they builders of ships among them who could have made them strong bench vessels, and these, if made, could have run them sailings to all the various cities of men in the way that people cross the sea by means of ships and visit each other, and they could have made this island a strong settlement for them. For it is not a bad place at all. It could bear all crops in season. And there are meadows land, meadowlands near the shores of the gray sea, well watered and soft. There could be grapes grown there endlessly, and there is smooth land for plowing. Men could reap a full harvest always in season, since there is very rich subsoil. Also, there is an easy harbor with no need for a hawser, nor anchor stones to be thrown ashore, nor cables to make fast. One could just run ashore and wait for the time when the sailors' desire stirred them to go and the right winds were blowing. Also, at the head of the harbor, there runs bright water, spring beneath rock, and there are black poplars growing around it. There we sailed ashore, and there was some god guiding us in through the gloom of night. Nothing showed to look at, for there was a deep mist around the ships, nor was there any moon showing in the sky. But she was under the clouds and hidden, there was none of us there whose eyes had spied out the island, and we never saw any long waves rolling in and breaking on the shore. But the first thing was when we were beached the well-benched vessels. Then, after we had beached the ships, we took all the sails down, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach, and there we fell asleep and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, we made a tour about the island, admiring everything there, and the nymphs, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, started the hill-roving goats on our way for my companions to feast on. At once we went and took from the ships curved bows and javelins with long sockets, and arranging ourselves in three divisions, cast about, and the god granted us the game we longed for. Now there were twelve ships that went with me, and for each one nine goats were portioned out, but I alone had ten for my portion. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there, feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine, for the red wine had not yet given out in the ships. There was some still left, for we all had taken away a great deal in storing jars when we stormed the Caconian sacred citadel. We looked across the land of the Cyclops 
and they were nearby. And we saw their smoke and heard sheep and goats bleeding. But when the sun went down, the sacred darkness came over. Then we lay down to sleep along the bleak break of the seashore. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I held an assembly and spoke forth before all. The rest of you, who are my eager companions, wait here while I, with my own ship and companions that are in it, go and find out about these people and learn what they are, whether they are savage and violent and without justice or hospital, hospitable to strangers with minds that are godly. So speaking, I went aboard the ship and told my companions also to go aboard and to cast off the stern cables. And quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks and sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the gray sea. But when we had arrived at the place which was nearby, there at the edge of the land, we saw the cave close to the water, high and overgrown with laurels, and in it were stabled great flocks, sheep and goats alike, and there was a fenced yard built around it, with a high wall of grubbed out boulders, and tall pines and oaks with lofty foliage. Inside there lodged a monster man, who now was herding the flocks at a distance away, alone, for he did not range with others, but stayed away by himself. His mind was lawless, and in truth, he was a monstrous wonder made to behold, not like a man, an eater of bread, but more like a wooded peak of the high mountains seen standing away from the others. At that time, I told the rest of my companions to stay where they were beside the ship and guard it. Meanwhile, I, choosing out the twelve best men among my companions, went on. But I had with me a goatskin bottle of black wine, sweet wine, given me by Maroon, son of Euthys, the pre and priest of Apollo, who besides Ismaros, who bestrides Ismaros. He gave it because, respecting him with his wife and child, we saved them from harm. He made his dwelling among the trees of the sacred grove of, of Phoebos, Apollo, and he gave me glorious presents. He gave me seven talents of well-wrought gold, and he gave me a mixing bowl made all of silver, and gave along with it wine, drawing it off in strong storing jars, twelve in all. This was a sweet wine, unmixed, a divine drink. No one of his servants or thralls that were in his household knew anything about it, but only himself and his dear wife and a single housekeeper. Whenever he drank this honey-sweet red wine, he would pour out enough to fill one cup. Then twenty measures of water were added, and the mixing bowl gave off a sweet smell, magical. Then would be no pleasure in holding off. Of this wine, I filled a great wineskin full and took provisions in the bag, for my proud heart had an idea that presently I would encounter a man who was endowed with great strength and wild, with no true knowledge of laws or any good customs. Lightly, we made our way to the cave, but we did not find him there. He was off herding on the range with his fat flocks. We went inside the cave and admired everything inside it. Baskets were there, heavy with cheeses, and the pens crowded with lambs and kids. They had all been divided into separate groups, the firstlings in one place, and then the middle ones, the babies again by themselves. And all his vessels, milk pails and pans that he used for milking into, were running over with whey. From the start, my companion spoke to me and begged me to take some of the cheeses and come back again and the next time to dry the lambs and kids from their pens and get back quickly to the ship again and go sailing off across the salt water. But I would not listen to them. It would have been better their way, not until I could see him, see if he would give me presents. My friends were to find the sight of him in no way lovely. There we built a fire and made sacrifice, and helping ourselves to the cheeses, we ate and sat waiting for him inside until he came home from his herding. He carried a heavy load of dried wood to make a fire for his dinner, and threw it down inside the cave, making a terrible crash. So in fear, we scuttled away into the cave's corners. Next, he drove into the wide cavern, all from the fat flocks that he would milk, but he left the male animals, billy goats and rams, outside his, in his yard with the deep fences. Next thing, he heaved up and set into position the huge doorstop, a massive thing, no 22 of the best four-wheeled wagons could have taken the, that weight off the ground and carried it. Such a piece of sky-towering cliff that was, that was he set over his gateway. Next, he sat down and milked his sheep and his bleeding goats, each of them in order, and put lamb 
or kid under each one to suck, then drew off half of the white milk and put it by in baskets made of wicker work stored for cheeses, and let the other half stand in the milk pail so as to have it to help himself to and drink from, and it would serve for his supper. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, at last he lit the fire and saw us and asked us a question. Strangers, who are you? From where do you come sailing over the watery ways? Is it on some business, or are you recklessly roving as pirates do when we sail on the salt when they sail on the salt sea and venture their lives as they wander, bringing evil to alien people? So he spoke, and the inward heart in us was broken in terror of the deep voice and for seeing him so monstrous. But even so, I had words for an answer, and I said to him. We are Achaeans, coming from Troy, beaten off our true course by winds from every direction across the great gulf of the open sea, making for home by the wrong way on the wrong courses. So we have come, so it has pleased Zeus to arrange it. We claim we are of the following of the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon, whose fame now is the greatest thing under heaven, such a city was that he sacked and destroyed so many people. But now, in turn, we come to you and are suppliants at your knees, if you might give us a guest present or otherwise some gift of grace, for such is the right of strangers. Therefore, respect the gods, O best of men. We are your suppliants. And Zeus, the guest god who stands behind all strangers with honors do them, avenges any wrong towards strangers and suppliants. So I spoke, but he answered me in pitiless spirit, Stranger, you are a simple fool, or come from, a f- from far off, When you tell me to avoid the wrath of the gods or fear them, the Cyclops do not concern themselves over Zeus of the Aegis, nor any of the rest of the blessed gods, since we are far better than they. And for fear they hate Zeus over the Aegis, oh, sorry, and for fear of the hate of Zeus, I would not spare you or your companions either, if the fancy took me otherwise. But tell me, so I may know, where did you... Put your well-made ships when you came, nearby or far off. So he spoke, trying me out. But I knew too much and was not deceived, but answered him in turn, and my words were crafty. Poseidon, shaker of the earth, has shattered my vessel. He drove it against the rocks on the outer coast of your country. Cracked on the cliff, it is gone. The wind on the sea took it. But I, with these you see, got away from sudden destruction. So I spoke. But he, in pitiless spirit, answered, Nothing, but sprang up. Sorry. So I spoke, but he, in pitiless spirit, answered nothing, but sprang up and reached for my companions, caught up two together and slapped them like killing puppies against the ground, and the brains ran all over the floor, soaking the ground. Then he cut them up by limb by limb and got supper ready, and like a lion reared in the hills without leaving anything, ate them, entrails, flesh, and the marrow bones alike. We cried out aloud and held our hands up to Zeus, seeing the cruelty of what he did, but our hearts were helpless. But when the Cyclops had filled his enormous stomach, feeding on human flesh and drinking down milk unmixed with water, he lay down to sleep in the cave, sprawled out through his sheep. Then I took counsel of myself and my great-hearted spirit to go up close, drawing from beside my thigh the sharp sword and stab him in the chest where the midriff joins in the liver, feeling for the place in my hand. But the second thought stayed me, for there we too would have perished away in sheer destruction, seeing that our hands could never have pushed away from the lofty gate, the cave, the the ponderous boulder he had propped there. So morning we waited, just as we were, for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again her rosy fingers, he lit his fire and then set about milking his glorious flocks, each of them in order and put lamb or kid under each one. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished again, he snatched up two men and prepared them for dinner, and when he had dined, drove his fat flocks out of the cavern, easily lifting off the great doorstone, but then he put it back again, like a man closing the lid on a quiver. And so the cyclops, whistling loudly, guided his fat flocks to the hills, leaving me there in the cave, mumbling my black thoughts of how I might punish him. Now how Athene might give me that glory. And, as I thought, this was the plan that seemed best to me. The Cyclops had been lying there beside the, beside the pen, a great bludgeon. 
of olive wood, still green. He had cut it so that when it dried out, he could carry it about. And we looked at it, considered it to be about the size for the mass of a cargo carrying broad black ship of 20 oars, which crosses the open sea. Such was the length of it, such the thickness to judge by looking. I went up and chopped a length of about a fathom and handed it over to my companions and told them to shave it down, and they made it smooth while I, standing by them, sharpened the point. Then put it over the blaze of the fire to harden. Then I put a well away and hid it under the ordure, which was all over the floor of the cave, much stuff lying about. Next, I told the rest of the men to cast lots to find out which of them must endure with me to take up the great beam and spin it in Cyclops' eye when he, when sweet sleep had come over him. <laughs> the ones drew it whom I myself would have wanted chosen. Four men, and I myself was the fifth and allotted with them. With the evening, he came back again, herding his fleecy flocks, but drove all his fat flocks inside the, the wide cave at once and did not leave any outside in the yard with a deep fence, whether he had some idea whether a god so urged him. When he had heaved up and set in position the huge doorstop, next he sat down and started milking his sheep and his bleeding goats, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, again he snatched up two men and prepared them for dinner. Then at last I, holding in my hands an ivy bowl full of black wine, stood close up to Cyclops and spoke out, here, Cyclops, have a drink of wine, now you have fed human on human flesh, and see what kind of drink or ship carried inside her. I brought it for you, and it would have been your libation had you taken pity and sent me home. But I cannot suffer your rages, cruel how any man can come and visit you ever again, now you have done what has no sanction. So I spoke, and he took it off and drank it off, and was terribly pleased with the wine he drank, and questioned me again, saying, Give me still more freely, and tell me your name straight away now, so I can give you a guest present to make you happy. For the grain-giving land of the Cyclops also yields them wine of strength, and it is Zeus's rain that waters it for them. But this comes from where ambrosia and nectar flow in abundance. So he spoke, and I gave him the gleaming wine again. Three times I brought it to him, and gave it to him. Three times he recklessly drained it. But when the wine had gotten to the brains of the Cyclops, then I spoke to him, and my words are full of beguilement. Cyclops, you asked me for my famous name. I will tell you, then, but you must give me a guest gift as you have promised. Nobody is my name. My father and mother calls me Nobody, and do as do all the others who are my companions. So I spoke, and he answered me in pitiless spirit. Then I will eat Nobody after his friends. And the others I will eat first, and that shall be my guest present to you. He spoke and slumped away and fell on his back and lay there with his thick neck crooked, crooked over to one side. And sleep, who subdues all, came upon him and captured him. And the wine gurgled up from his gullet with gobs of human meat. This was his drunken vomiting. Then I shoved the beam underneath the, a deep bed of cinders, waiting for it to heat. And I spoke to all my companions in words of courage, so none should be in panic and back out. But when the beam of, of olive, green as it was, was nearly at the point of catching fire and glowed, terribly incandescent, then I brought it close up from the fire, and my friends about me stood fast. Some great divinity breathed courage into us. They seized the beam of olive, sharp to the end, and leaned on it into the eye, while I, from above, leaning my weight on it, twirled it like a man with a brace and bit who bores into a ship timber, and his men from underneath, grasping the strap on either side, whirl it, and it bites resolutely deeper. So seizing the fire point hard in timber, we twirled it in his eye, and the blood boiled around the hot point, so that the blast and scorch of the burning ball singed all his eyebrows and eyelids, and the fire made the roots of his eye crackle, as when, as when a man who works a blacksmith plunges a screaming great axe blade or plane into cold water, treating it for temper, since this is the way steel is made strong, even so, Cyclops' eyes sizzled about the beam of the olive. He gave a giant, horrible cry, and rocks rattled the sound, and we scuttled away in fear. He pulled the timber out of his eye, and it blubbered with plenty of blood. Then when he had frantically taken it in his hands and thrown it away, 
he cried aloud to the other Cyclops who live around him in their own caves along the windy pinnacles. They, hearing him, came swarming up from their various places and stood around the cave and asked him what was the trouble. Why, Polyphemus, what do you want with all this outcry? Through the immortal night you have made all of us sleepless. Surely no mortar against your will can be driving your sheep off. Surely none can be killing you by force or treachery. Then, from inside the cave, strong Polyphemus answered, Good friends, nobody is killing me by force or treachery. So then the others, speaking in winged words, gave him an answer. If alone as you are, none, of, none uses violence on you. Why there is no avoiding the sickness sent by great Zeus. So you had better pray to your father, the Lord Poseidon. So they spoke as they went away. And the heart within me laughed over how my name and my perfect planning had fooled him. But the Cyclops, groaning aloud in the pain of his agony, fell with his hands and took the boulder out of the doorway and sat down at the entrance himself, spreading his arms wide to catch anyone who tried to get out with the sheep, hoping that I would be so guileless in my heart as to try this. But I was planning so that things would come out the best way. And trying to find some release from death for my companions, and myself too, combining all my resource and treacheries, as with life at stake, for the great evil was very close to us, and, as I thought, this was the plan that seemed best to me. There were some male sheep, rams, well-nourished, thick and fleecy, handsome and dark, with a dark depth of a wool. Silently, I caught these and lashed them together with a pliant willow wigs, where the monstrous cyclops lawless of mine had used to sleep. I had them in threes, and the one in the middle carried a man, while the other two went on the side. Three rams carried each man, but as for myself, there was one ram, far the finest of all the flock. This one I clasped around the back, snuggled under the wool of the belly, and stayed there still. By the firm twist of the hands, and enduring spirit clung fast to the glory of this fleece unrelenting. So we greed for the time and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers... Then the male sheep hastened out of the cave towards the pasture, but the ewes were bleeding all through the pens unmilked, their udders ready to burst. Meanwhile, their master, suffering and in bitter pain, felt over the backs of all the sheep standing up as they were, but in his guileness did not notice how many men were fastened under the breasts of his fleecy sheep. Last of all the flock, the ram went out the doorway, loaded with his own fleece and with me and my close counsels. Then, feeling him, powerful Polyphemus, spoke a word to him. My dear old ram, why are you thus leaving the cave last, last of the sheep? Never in the old days were you left behind by the flock. But long striding, far ahead of the rest, would pasture on the tender bloom of the grass, be first at running rivers, and be eager always to lead the way first back to the sheepfold at evening. Now you are last of all. Perhaps you are grieving for your master's eye, which is a bad man with his wicked companions, put out after he had made my brain helpless with wine, this nobody who I think has not yet got clear of destruction. If only you could think like us and only be given a voice to tell me where he is skulking away from my anger, then surely he would be smashed against the floor and his brains go splattering all over the cave to make my heart lighter from the burden of all the evils of this nittering nobody gave me. So he spoke and sent the ram along from him outdoors. And when he had got a little way from the yard and to the cavern, first I got myself loose from my ram, then set my companions free and rapidly then, and with many a blackward glance, we drove the long striding ship rich with fat until we reached our ship. And the side of us who had escaped death was welcome to our companions, but they began to mourn for the others. And not only I would not let them cry out, but with my brows nodded each man and told them, to be quick and to load the fleecy sheep on board our vessel and sail out on the salt water. Quickly they went aboard the ship and sat through the oarlocks, and sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the gray sea. But when I was far from the land as a voice shouting carries, I called out aloud to the Cyclops, taunting him. Cyclops, in the end it was no weak man's companions you were to eat by violence and force in your hollow cave, and your evil deeds were to catch up with you and be too strong for you, hard one, who dared to eat your own guest in your own house, so Zeus and the rest of the gods have punished you. So I spoke, and still more the heart in him was angered, 
He broke away the peak of a great mountain and let it fly and threw it in front of the dark, proud ship by only a little. It just failed to graze the steering oar's edge, but the sea washed up in a splash as the stone went under. The tidal wave it made swept us suddenly back from the open sea to the mainland again and forced us on shore. Then I caught up in my hands a very long pole and rushed her clear again and urged my companions with words and nodding with my head to throw their weight on the oars and bring us out of the threatening evil. And they leaned on and rowed hard. But when we had cut through the sea to twice the previous distance, again I started to call to Cyclops. But my friends about me checked me, first one, then another, speaking, trying to soothe me. Hardwin, why are you trying once more to stir up this savage man who just now threw this, his missile in the sea, forcing our ship to the land again? And we thought once more we were finished. And if he had heard a voice or any one of us speaking, he would have broken all our heads and our ship timbers with a cast of a great jagged stone, so strong as his throwing. So they spoke, but could not persuade the great heart in me. But once again, in the anger of my heart, I cried to him, Cyclops, if any mortal man ever asked you who it was that inflicted upon your eye this shameful blinding, tell him that you were blinded by Odysseus, sacker of cities. Laertes is his father, and he makes his home in Ithaca. So I spoke, and he groaned aloud and answered me, saying, Ah, now a prophecy spoken of old has come to completion. There used to be a man here, great and strong, and a prophet, Telemos, Eurymos' son, who for prophecy was preeminent and grew old as a prophet among the Cyclops. This man told me how all this that had happened now must some day be accomplished, and how I must lose the sight of my eye at the hands of Odysseus. But always I was on lookout for a man handsome and tall, with great endowment of strength on him to come here. But now the end of it is that a little man, nittering feeble, has taken away the sight of my eye, first making me helpless with wine. So come here, Odysseus, let me give you a guest gift and urge the glorious shaker of the earth to grant you conveying its home. For I am his son. He announces himself as my father. He himself will heal me, if he will, but not any other one of the blessed gods, nor any man who is mortal. So he spoke, but I answered him again and said to him, I only wish it were certain I could make you reft of spirit and life and send you to the house of Hades, as it is certain that not even the shaker of the earth will ever heal your eye for you. So I spoke, but he then called the Lord Poseidon in prayer, reaching both arms up toward the starry heaven. Hear me, Poseidon, who circle the earth dark-haired. If truly I am your son and you acknowledge yourself as my father, grant that Odysseus, sacker of cities, son of Laertes, who makes his home in Ithaca, may never reach that home. But if it is decided that he shall see his own people and come home to his strong-founded house and to his own country, let him come late in bad case, with the loss of all his companions and someone else's ship, and find troubles in his household. So he spoke in prayer, and the dark-haired god heard him. Then for the second time, lifting a stone far greater, he whirled it and threw, leaning into the cast his strength beyond measure. And the stone fell behind the dark, proud ship by only a little. It just failed to graze the steering oar's edge, and the sea washed up in the splash as the stone went under. The tidal wave drove us along forward and forced us onto the island. But after we had made, after we had so made the island, where all the rest of our strong bench, bench ships were waiting together, and our companions were sitting about them grieving, having waiting so long for us, making this point, we ran our ship on the sand and beached her, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach, and from the hollow ships bringing out the flocks of the cyclops, we shared them out so none might go cheated of its proper portion. But for me alone, my strong grief companions expect, accepted the, the ram when the sheep were shared, and I sacrificed him on the stand, sands to Zeus, dark-clouded son of Kronos, lord over all, and burned him the thighs. But he was not moved by my offerings, but still was pondering on a way how all my strong bench ships should be destroyed, and all my eager companions. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I urged on the rest of my companions and told them to go aboard their ships and to cast off the stern cables. And quickly they went aboard the ships and sat at the oar locks, and sitting well in order, dashed their oars in the gray sea. From there, we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at heart for the lost loss of our dear companions.